everyone, it's Celeste with Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Today I'm going to be telling you about one of our ongoing research projects. It's the American Oyster Catcher Study, which our Director of Conservation Research, Susan Heath, has been working on for 10 years. In this study, Dr. Heath investigates the western gulf population of American oyster catchers. The American oyster catcher is a bird species of high concern. Even though a lot was known about the oyster catchers on the Atlantic coast, little was known about the ones on the western Gulf Coast. Through this study, we've learned a lot about the life history of Gulf Coast oyster catchers. We've discovered that the western Gulf oyster catchers prefer to nest on bay islands. Because of this, they are subject to overwash, predation, and human disturbance. These and other factors put pressure on the struggling oyster catcher population. The American oyster catcher is a shorebird with a long orange bill, thick head and neck, and long pale legs. American oyster catchers have a brown back and wings with black head and breast, white underparts, yellow eye, and red eye ring. In flight, look for a white wing bar and white tail base. American oyster catchers probe sand and search reefs for clams, oysters, and other mollusks which they then open up by cutting or smashing. During high tide, they rest in their roost. They are loud, alert, and finicky. They are commonly seen on bay islands and occasionally beaches. In this environment, they prefer shells to nest on. Artificial beaches, such as dredge spoil islands with lots of oyster shells, also work for nesting and roosting. American oyster catchers are monogamous and sometimes remain paired with the same mate for many years. Males tend to be territorial and will nest in the same area year after year. Chicks can usually walk within a few hours of hatching. To get an idea of what this research actually consists of, I joined Dr. Heath on a visit to some of her research sites. I headed out on GCBO's own boat along with our intern Morgan, coastal biologist Taylor, and of course, Dr. Heath. We boated out to Drum Bay, keeping an eye out for oyster catchers and other birds. First, we came across a colony of terns who were not very happy with our presence. Here, you can see how human disturbance really bothers birds. We were simply driving past them, but it really upset them. Not all birds react by swarming and calling like terns do, but one can imagine that human presence disturbs them nonetheless. American oyster catchers like to hang out on these bay reefs made out of oyster shells. These reefs are naturally created as oysters grow. Young oysters attach to the shells of old ones, and as these oysters grow, reproduce, die, and host new oysters, the reefs get larger and larger. When we landed on one of these reefs, we could even see the oysters opening up and spitting out water. Difficult to catch on camera, but cool to see in person. There are many different factors in Dr. Heath's study, and one of them is water levels. On this day, she was testing some of her equipment to gauge elevation and water level. If the water levels are too high, the bird's nest can be washed away and the eggs will die. If the elevation of the island is too low, the habitat is underwater regularly and is unusable as nesting habitat. Sue measures the elevation at the high point of each reef so she can tell at what tide level the reefs become exposed and thus available for bird use. We searched the bay for oyster catchers and found a pair pretty quickly. The pair, which Sue recognized, wasn't where she expected them to be. American oyster catchers tend to be monogamous. The male and female will stay together throughout the breeding and nesting season, sharing responsibility for incubating the eggs and taking care of the chicks. Often these couples will stay together year after year and return to the same area every year to mate. This pair was on an island that Sue hadn't seen them on before, and they were acting kind of suspicious as if they had a nest. Sue got out of the boat and explored the island and the islands nearby. She looked for any signs of a nest, but there were none. Perhaps the birds were getting ready to nest, but they hadn't had anything yet. When American oyster catchers nest, they don't do it in a tree or bush. Rather, they do it on the ground. 
To make the nest bowl, they create a shallow indentation called a scrape. Then they lay their eggs directly in the bowl and incubate them until the chicks hatch. When looking for oyster catcher nests, Sue looks for scrapes, footprints, and of course, eggs. She also pays attention to how the parents are acting when she's looking around. If they keep an eye on her, do alarm calls, or try to lead her away, it might indicate that they have a nest. To keep track of the oyster catchers, Dr. Heath bans them. Without bans, it would be impossible to keep track of which bird was which over the course of 10 years and thousands of miles. Dr. Heath bans her birds with metal bands and maroon colored bands with white letters and numbers. The letters on the bands are big enough to see with binoculars, so we can avoid getting close and bothering the birds when we study them. Sue's birds are tagged with either two-letter or three-letter codes. For the two-letter code, you can read it by starting with the underlined letter on the left and reading to the right. So this code is L5 and not 5L. For the three-letter codes, you can start by reading the letter on top followed by the letter on the bottom to the left and then to the right. So this one is W1Y. Each code is repeated twice on the band. And for Sue's project, the bands are the same on both legs. For example, you can see this American oyster catcher has the band number JA and the juvenile has the band number U5U. Today, Dr. Heath wants to band a new chick that she's been monitoring. We caught the chick and brought it back to the boat to band it. I got to hold the chick as Sue banded it and measured the bill length, wing length, weight, and other measurements. Taking these measurements is important for keeping track of the health of the bird. Then Sue took the chick back to its island and let it go. We hurried away so as not to bother them further, and the chick ran off to its parents. We ended the day by visiting more oyster catcher pairs, but didn't see any more chicks. The next day, we headed out into another study area, East Matagorda Bay. We saw a lot more wildlife in this bay, including a dolphin, brown pelicans, roseate spoonbills, and even a magnificent frigate bird. It was a fun safari for me, but for the American oyster catchers, having so many neighbors can be problematic. Oyster catchers are territorial, but with nesting habitat so hard to come by, sometimes they find themselves on islands with other nesting shorebirds or waterbirds. This puts more strain on the oyster catchers to find sufficient food, habitat, and other resources. Some water birds can even predate the oyster catcher's chicks and eggs. These laughing gulls, for example, are prolific predators. We ended up finding a new oyster catcher nest. You can notice that the eggs blend in perfectly with the shells as camouflage. This makes it harder for predators to find the nest. Sue notes the number of eggs, how the parents are acting, and even what substrate the nest is on. She also takes a GPS point so she can find the nest again. Dr. Sue has analyzed all of the data that she's collected over 10 years. She can now say with certainty that American oyster catchers who nest on the mainland are usually unsuccessful. There are too many predators and other dangers, and the eggs and chicks don't often make it to adulthood. American oyster catchers who nest on bay islands have far better luck. But if the island is too big, they often have to share their space with colonies of laughing gulls. These gulls eat the oyster catcher chicks and eggs, so those nests don't generally make it either. The most successful nests were found on bay islands that were too small for laughing gull colonies, but big enough that they weren't washed over by waves during a storm. That's a very specific nesting habitat. This is crucial information for those who want to help these birds. In order to create more nesting habitat, we need to build up more small bay islands. Without Dr. Sue's research, we would have never known how to save this population of American oyster catchers. Thanks, Dr. Sue! Now that the study has been going on for many years, there are over 350 banded American oyster catchers in Texas. If you see one and know what the code says, please report it to Dr. Sue at sheath at gcbo.org. 
If you can get a photo of the code, that would be even better. We really appreciate your support. If you'd like to get more involved with our conservation work, you can sign up to be a volunteer with us. To keep up with our events and what we're doing, you can follow us on Facebook. Visit us online at gcbo.org to sign up for our e-news, learn more about us, and shop at our online store. If you'd like to come visit us and walk our trails, our hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. If you'd like more information, would like to set up an education day, or would like to sign up to be a volunteer, you can call us at 979-480-0999 or email us at info at gcbo.org. From Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, we thank you for watching and hope to see you soon.